Hey, first of all, thank you very much for doing this on a Sunday. I know that uh, gets into family time, and I know you got three little beautiful little daughters that you've got, and a husband, and, and you're a very busy person. Um, congratulations on a couple things this year. 2020 has been a bit of a bummer for for many people, but you've been uh, you've been uh, doing well yourself with uh, appearance on the Titan Games for the Rock, and then you just won the Mrs. Nebraska Beauty Contest. So, congrats on all those things. You continue to continue to have a full time job as a ob gin doc and uh, doing all these other extra stuff so you're i would call a stud in the community <laughs> <laughs> you know, my version of a female stud um but that's uh, that's awesome so just and then i guess you did a 51 mile walk yesterday yeah i've been doing a, i think i walked like 75 miles this week so i know it's tough and I, I've, yeah. I've been doing maybe 10 12 miles a day but just a lot of it uphill but i know that's a big thing too so i underestimated it honestly straight through i was like it's just walking i mean i was yeah. like that's a long ways i know i've done the drive in a car obviously but that's i mean straight through that is a long ways through the middle of the night um <laughs> so yeah let's I'm, talk let's let's I'm talk hurting i'm hurting today i'm not gonna uh, lie yeah, i know you're probably pretty sore I, yeah i walked 12 miles uphill yesterday and so i'm a little sore today but hey for those that don't know you and i think many of us do but some may not can you just give us a quick background uh, summary yep so i'm Born and raised in Nebraska, I'm a Midwest girl, uh, and I played college softball for the University of Nebraska, and after I left college, I went to medical school up in Omaha, met my husband, and we have three daughters, like you mentioned, um, who are currently five, seven, and nine, um, but I ate horrible growing up, never really took care of myself, I was a three-sport athlete, but grew up kind of, you know, in the 80s, 90s on the standard, like low fat diet, lots of boxed foods, you know, hamburger helper. And then I went and got this nutrition degree, right? And then I went to medical school and all of a sudden had a huge change of pace in my life. So now I'm sitting, I'm sedentary, I'm studying for long hours out of the day. And then got pregnant with my first daughter and pregnancy is quite a physiologic test of anybody's body. So I failed my glucose testing after my first daughter was born, was diagnosed with hypothyroidism, so went on medication for that. And then in the middle of my third pregnancy, I was working as an as a OBGYN at that time, and I um, had a huge tragedy in my life. I had one of my best friends die in the middle of her own pregnancy, and it was kind of this just pivotal moment in my life where... Um, I was diagnosed with pre-diabetes shortly after that, and I just felt like a fraud. Here I was as a physician and a mom, and I'm an OBGYN, and I'm telling my patients to eat healthy and don't gain too much weight. And I just really started thinking, I'm like, this just doesn't make sense. Like, I have this nutrition degree, I have this medical degree, and like, I can't figure it out for myself. So I really started out in 2015, 2016, just on a personal journey to fix my own health. And kind of started with a, like a whole 30 and then a paleo approach. And then eventually kind of fell on a ketogenic diet. And then in 2018, I'm like losing track of time now, but 2018 really um, adopted more of a carnivore based diet and have never looked back. I, my pre-diabetes is gone. I'm off my hypothyroidism, you know, medication. I don't take any meds. I don't, I'm not really a, a fan of supplements in general, and what started as really changing my diet just manifested into just like the fog lifted. I started, I opened a, a consulting business. Of course, you mentioned the things I've done in 2020. It's opened a lot of doors for me, Titan Games. I signed up for a beauty pageant, which I've never done in my entire life. But it really, it really gave me my entire life. I mean, it just, it, I'm pursuing things I never would have before because I was tired and I didn't have the energy and I didn't feel good. And I just thought that's what life was like when you're, you have a full-time job and three small kids and a husband that works at night. I just thought that's what life was like, you know? And I used a lot of those excuses like, oh, you know, you're busy. You've accomplished a lot in your life. And I call it like the blame, shame, and justify game that we all do with ourselves. We're super good at lying to ourselves. And after I fixed my diet, it was like, I didn't have an excuse anymore. It, I just, I felt so amazing. And now I'm just really passionate about showing my patients how to walk the walk and talk the talk. Cause as you know, Dr. Baker in medicine, we're not doing a good job for our patients. Um, doctors aren't setting the example and a lot of them just don't understand, you know, we've just kind of been brainwashed to believe that fat was the driver of chronic disease and, and that medications are, are what fixes these things. And it's pretty incredible to watch my own patients feel empowered, you know, that they really do have a lot of control over their own health. Um, and we could be preventing a lot more chronic disease as this message really, you know, gets out. 
Yeah, I mean, I think clearly there's a lot of frustration both on both sides, the patient sides and the and the physician sides of how sort of you know, with the lack of efficacy as we are for, for doing this thing. And I, I didn't realize you had a nutrition degree. I must have missed that out. So it's interesting, I guess, when you're going through medical school and you, you got to the probably the meager amount of nutrition they taught, you probably thought this is, you know, not particularly <laughs> very robust. But um, let me ask you about just a couple of things you did this year. So just because people are going to curious about that. Titan Games, how, how, how did that go? What was the experience like? Uh, you know, and then beauty con i mean i i had a girlfriend that was a beauty contest when that's the only beauty contest i ever went to i just did, i just don't know much about it but <laughs> and, and i'm just going to want what inspired you to do those things how did, how did the how did the rock thing work out and how did how did you get involved in that i know it was i think it was a big secret you were talking about when you were trying to put together that uh speaking engagement that i went to in nebraska i guess that was what's going on in the background that you were yeah. to talk about but talk about those two things real briefly and then we can get into some more of the medical type stuff yeah, so in Titan Games, this was season two that I appeared on. And when season one came out, I had a scrub tech. I was scrubbing into surgery in the operating room. And she said, hey, you should apply to be on the Titan Games show. And I had no idea what it was. I actually had to Google it, look it up. And I was like, this looks like American Gladiator from when I was a little girl. And I grew up as an athlete. So, I mean, I love, I love you know, everybody that knows my message. I love that women lift weights and women should feel like they can feel strong and it's not masculine. And I was like, Oh, this would be a really cool opportunity. Well, I looked what you had to do to apply. And it was a crazy amount of, of, of physically difficult things. And for, for anybody that doesn't know my journey, I started to fix my diet in 2015, 2016, but I did not get back into the gym. I was a two time lifter of the year at Nebraska, but I did not get back into the gym lifting weights until March of 2018. So that was when I first started picking up heavy things was in March of 2018. And this was right around the time that I had heard about Titan Games. And I thought, there's no way. I'm looking at the people on the show. They're like top CrossFitters in the world. I was like, I'm just a doctor. You know, all those self-limiting beliefs. So I decided I wasn't going to apply for the show. But I had started kind of following them on social media. And then when The Rock put out a message that he was looking for people for season two, here I was now like a year into my journey of like lifting weights again. And I thought, why not try? Like the worst that happens is you apply and you don't get on the show and nobody will ever know. Um, so I ended up applying and I ended up getting asked to come out to a combine um, where you actually have to physically try out. And there was a hundred people out there and they only selected 18 women and 18 men to be on the show. And I was selected to compete, which was humbling because I'm just telling you, these are like the fastest, strongest people. And, and not only that, but they're all good people and they have great stories and they've you know, been in wars and like just in you know, crazy, incredible, inspiring stories. It's TV. They, you know, want good stories. So, um, yes, I had a huge disruption in my life. I'm a full-time practicing doctor. So for them to call me and say, Oh, Hey, we need you to come out. Um, it was filmed in, um, Atlanta, Georgia, cause that's where the rock lives now. And that's where he's filming his current Netflix movie. So we filmed in Atlanta, Georgia, actually union city, right outside of Atlanta. And The Rock is amazing. He's exactly like anybody sees on TV. He's just this big, super nice guy. Um, I think he's shorter than the internet lists him, but his biceps are, I think, as big as my quad. He's just huge. Um, but it was very, very cool. The people I met on the show, incredible. Anybody that watched it, they're just really good people. And for me, you know, everybody says, what now after Titan Games? I'm like, well, I'm going back to my job. I mean, I like being a doctor. I really do. Um, but it was cool just to be out there competing again. It had been 13 years since I had competed in college. So it just felt so good to get out there and just compete again. Um, and then after Titan Games finished, we didn't think it was going to be released for a year. But because of COVID and the Olympics being canceled, um, they rushed production on it. And so it came out actually just a couple months later. So that was fun, a fun thing to do on Monday nights uh, during this whole 2020 escapade. But around the same time I applied for Titan Games, I had a neighbor who has competed in pageants before, who said, you should apply to run for Mrs. Nebraska. I've never done pageants um, ever, ever in my entire life. And I signed up and I was <laughs> like, had this immediate regret. I was like, what am I doing? I don't know what I'm doing. I, I'm totally, totally out of my box on this one. So I hired a coach. I'm coachable. Um, I, I learned what you have to do. I practiced walking in heels. And, you know, I was going to be humbled either way just to go do it and just to show my daughters, you know, 2020 for me has been like showing the world what you can do when you try. And I also feel like 
my message of nutrition and fitness and, and just female empowerment. It was just another platform that I could use to spread the message, um, especially for the meat eaters out there. <laughs> So I did the pageant. Um, I really, honestly, there was great competition. I, you know, I, I was, didn't know, you know, that I was going to win and, and I came out winning. Um, so now I'm going on to compete at Mrs. America, which is just kind of the next, you know, level of platform. And I'm sure everybody listening on here will be so excited to know that I have uh, three sponsors for the pageant and they're a salt company, a meat company, and an organ supplement company. So it's just another opportunity to kind of show the world you know, what you can accomplish when you take care of your body. So it was, it's 2020 has been fun for me. I know it's been a headache for a lot of people, but um, you, you just make what you can of it. Yeah, that's, that's good. So when is the, uh, when is the Miss, Mrs. Uh, uh, USA or America? Pageant? Mrs. America. Yeah. So it was, suppo- well, we've been here. We actually don't have an official date. It's supposed to be in Las Vegas. They're monitoring the COVID activity and we're, we've been told late October, early November, but we don't have an official date. So I'm, I'm prepping for it. I have to have a bunch of things turned in by October 4th um, in preparation for it. So uh, it's hard for me because I have a clinical practice in a life. So it's hard for me to plan, but it's supposed to be happening probably in November. They may have to move cities. I don't know. It all depends what's going on with COVID. Yeah, I guess I, well, I, I'm curious a little bit about, because um, I see a lot of bodybuilding contests are going on, but I see a lot of the athletes wearing masks on stage. I mean, they, I can't imagine they would do a beauty pit contest with people wearing masks. Did they try to talk about that, or how did that work? Yeah, we did not have to. So in Nebraska, we abided by all the current restrictions. The people in the audience had to wear masks, but we didn't have to. Um, and of course, they tried to you know socially distance us and whatnot backstage and things like that. But we've been pretty lucky in Nebraska, our numbers um, have been great. Our mortality rates are like some of the lowest in the country. So luckily in Nebraska, we've you know done quite well. But um, of course, you take a place like Las Vegas, that has a lot of international travel, and they're very, um, you know, hesitant to really open things back up. I think they just this week have allowed their bars to reopen. But um, events in Nebraska, we can have an outdoor event with 30,000 people right now. And we can have an indoor event with up to a thousand without getting permission from the health department. So Nebraska is pretty open. We're like in phase four or whatever, but yeah, I don't know how you can have a beauty patch with your face covered up, but I, they do heavily weight in the Mrs. Division. They do heavily weight the interview. So I suppose you could do an interview with a mask on, but, <laughs> but the other parts of it are evening gown and swimsuit competition. And for Mrs. It's a one piece. It's not a bikini. So. All right. Well, all I want, all I ever wanted to know about beauty contests. So, let's talk a little. Let's move over to the health a little bit. Um, so you've, you know, obviously been a low carb advocate. You know, even a meat based advocate. I think that's, you know, it's good to see. There's because you know, obviously you're in the minority, but I think a growing minority, which is cool to see, is more positioned yeah. or are, are being a little more vocal about this stuff and kind of getting tired of all the nonsense of, uh, you know, we're just not helping our people. Uh, you've been playing with continuous glucose monitors. You know, I, I know we even had a little little feedback. I, I, I just caution people by utilizing them to hack junk food. You know, I, that's my concern is they're just going to sit there. I can eat these keto junk food bars and it doesn't, it doesn't spike my glucose and therefore it's good for me. And I think, I think a lot of people will end up doing that. I think we'll see the, the processed food companies do that. They'll put these things, it's not going to spike your glucose, so it must be good. Uh, but talk to me about uh, how that has been helpful, because I do think it can be utilized as an effective tool. Uh, but at the same time, I think we still have issues with food addiction. We have sugar addiction. And just because, I mean, like, it's not a surprise that eating chocolate cake raises someone's glucose. I don't think anyone's shocked by that. But yet people still do it, even though they know it's going to raise their glucose, even 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 diabetics. So knowledge does not all, always equal change. You know, you have to fix those relationships. But, but talk about some of the things you've been learning and gleaning from from the CGM uh, experiments that you and I guess Danny Vega are both doing. We had Danny on a while ago, and I, and I like Danny; he's a really good guy. But uh, talk to me a little bit about low carb stuff. What do you what do you see the benefits of low carb versus perhaps low fat or just low calorie in general? Because a lot of people will will say, you know, all the benefits are just one hundred percent related to caloric restriction. I I tend to disagree because I see a lot of people that you know, see benefit, independent benefit outside of caloric restriction, outside of weight loss. Uh, But let me, I want to hear your perspective on some of this stuff. Yeah. I think the clinical utility with CGMs is with this concept of glycemic variability. So just like you said, there's a lot of people that believe that it's just caloric restriction. You know, 
you go on a carnivore diet, you go on a vegan diet, you go on a whole food diet and right. You're just immediately getting rid of all the BS and the processed foods and things like that. And that's why people see health benefits. And that's probably true to a point. But for me, glycemic variability is also super important because we know one of the pathophysiologies of, of diabetic disease, right, is this micro, microvascular disease. And a lot of that microvascular disease is caused by these huge spikes in blood sugar. So you slap a continuous glucose monitor on people and you make them aware of these, of these variations in their blood sugar, even with whole foods. So I've done an experiment in the past, almost a year ago now, where I did a vegan diet for a couple of days, eating things like oatmeal and you know mangoes and things like this just to show people the difference in glycemic variability between a vegan diet and a carnivore diet. Um, because right, they're both devoid of processed foods and garbage and things like that, but there's still a big difference for people with, with glucose control. And I, as a former pre-diabetic, that's a huge deal for me. Um, the other thing that I think patients get out of it clinically, um, first of all, it is a great form of accountability for a lot of patients. So even though they know that eating a slice of chocolate cake is going to spike their blood sugars, Sometimes they're surprised, oh my God, like how high it really spikes it or how long their glucose actually stays elevated. And the other part of that too, is they start to make connections between how they feel and what's going on with their blood sugars. Like for me, when I test out something, like I tested out honey, you know, for everybody, but you know, some people consider that to be carnivore, did a tablespoon of honey. My blood sugar shot up to 160. Usually when mine gets to about 150, I get like a, a headache. Um, and then the other thing that happens is, is Anytime I have a spike and then a huge drop, as my body is starting to secrete these counter-regulatory hormones to bring my glucose back up, I start to, I usually get very anxious or I get very irritable. Um, and so I have patients that learn a lot just about how good they feel, the less glycemic variability they have. And I think it's amazing when I eat carnivore, I mean, you can see it. It's just like this very nice, slow little undulating line. I mean, it just looks phenomenal. And that's why I feel phenomenal. Um, but for some people, you know, they can tolerate whole food carbs and if that's, what's right for them, you know, sweet potatoes or squash or whatever. So sometimes it's good, I think, just to test those whole food carbs and see what they do for, for you. Um, I, I my patients love them. I think that even if people just warm for 14 days, if you're a carnivore, I mean, I can already tell you what it's going to look like. <laughs> um, but I also agree with with what you're saying about this keto junk food, you know, a lot of people message me and they're like, oh, can you try this bar or this bar or this keto dessert? And honestly, like, I don't really eat that stuff. I don't enjoy that stuff. And I don't have the CGM to test those things. I definitely have tried them for people before. And, and there are a lot of keto products out there that have sketchy fibers and things in them that actually do spike your blood sugar. So that's the hardest part is, you know, people are very smart with marketing and they'll slap low carb or keto or low net carbs on a product when it's probably not good for somebody that's insulin resistant. Um, but I, I love, I have my CGM on right now. I love wearing it. I think my patients learn a lot from it. Um, but there's always going to be somebody that uses it once again as some way to justify their behavior. <laughs> and that's not necessarily the goal of it all. Yeah, I want to I want to get into some of the women's just because a lot of women want to ask you some questions, and I think that's something that 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 you know you're a great resource for. But a couple of comments, um, there was a meta analysis, so I think I posted on my Instagram that they looking at carb consumption and then energy and mood post consumption, and, and almost every study they looked at, you know, I think there were RCTs showed dip in energy afterwards. You know, this this post glucose crash, which we all know about, and some people call it brain fog and all that stuff. So I, I think that's a a, a real thing. And I think the CGM can help you with that. But let me hear, I want to know, because, you know, we're talking about glycemic variability and, you know, there's a lot of studies that support, you know, these big blood sugar spikes can be damaging, but what some people see with acute exercise, I mean, really intense, like sprinting will jack your blood glucose pretty darn high. And so the, the question is, is that damaging us too? Or is it, you know, because then you would say, well, maybe exercise is bad for us. And then that's kind of a hard one to, to justify. So I think it's, you know, you have to, have to be careful of these metrics because we don't know what everything means yet. My, my assumption is when you exercise, you become more insulin sensitive in that acute period and you can dispose of it. But what are your thoughts on that, that big spike you get from, because from, we know what happens is hepatic output of glucose goes up 1500%. You know, you can, you can, your, your glucose can just crank out, it can just break down glycogen and just crank up that blood sugar uh, to support what you're doing. But what are your thoughts around the, the variability that we see with exercise? Yeah. So the other thing that you see when you put on a continuous glucose monitor is what happens to your blood sugars 
in regards to all activity, right? Sex, sleep, hit exercise. So I can get my glucose, if I do an intense high intensity interval, I can get mine up into the 150s and 160s. Um, funny, I don't get a headache like I do if it was, you know, to a, an oral glucose load. Um, so I think that's also fascinating to look at. Now, your question is, you know, if you eat a tablespoon of honey and it spikes to 160 and you do high intensity interval to 160 and you're telling people not to eat honey because it spikes your blood sugar, are those two things equally damaging? And I think this is where you have to not get, you know, focused in. I think everything has to be taken in context. So for the people listening, the reason that your blood sugar goes to 150, 160, if you're doing high intensity interval training is your body doesn't know if you're out running a bear, right? Um, your body purposefully puts out energy so that you can utilize it. You're doing this high intensity interval, you need available energy. And so like Dr. Baker said, your liver starts breaking down glycogen for energy. It starts stimulating gluconeogenesis because our body has the ability to produce glucose from protein and fat substrates, even if you're lower zero carb. Um, now the question being, does that damage your microvascular? Um, I don't know that I can specifically answer that, but I can tell you that when you are exercising and you're putting that much glucose out into your bloodstream, you're using it, right? So you're, you're shuttling glucose into the muscles for energy. Um, you're using that as energy, very different than if you ate a donut and then sat on the couch and we're not doing anything. Also, you know, the rebound effect from, from an oral glucose load is certainly a lot different than from high intensity exercise. Now, something like weightlifting, my blood sugar definitely doesn't go as high. I may get up to maybe 100, 110. Mine really only spikes with that very, very, very high intensity energy output. Um, and we do know that HIIT training is, is more of a stress on the system, right? So you always have to recover just as hard as you train. So, you know, the question being is, you know, is it good for you to train at that level of intensity all the time? I don't know that I can specifically answer that, but I know when you think about the, the context of the situation of like, why is the blood sugar that high? It's for a purposeful reason. Eating something and getting your blood sugar that high, no purpose at all. Yeah, I think, I think the contextual aspect of this is important with, with all these different biomarkers. I mean, I think it's just an important way to look at that. We can look, we can look at a number of different things. Let me ask you about uh, pregnant women and there's a lot of low, cause you probably manage a lot of low carb pregnant women. And we know that they will very often fail an oral glucose tolerance test. And so do you see a utility for a CGM in, in their situation? How do you, how do you counsel those particular patients? Yeah. So pregnancy in and of itself is, is a state of physiologic insulin resistance. So the, no matter what your diet is before coming into pregnancy, in the second half of pregnancy, the body becomes very catabolic and you purposefully develop not only insulin resistance, but leptin resistance. And that's so that the mom maintains her appetite. So she continues to eat and eat and eat. That's where people get this idea of like pregnancy cravings. Um, so you have this physiologic insulin resistance that happens. So in patients who are low carb, they're not used to taking in 50 grams in an oral glucose challenge. And so their pancreas isn't used to responding to that level of insulin output. And so they're more likely to fail the test. And a lot of doctors don't understand this, but there are published studies that show that if you carb load, even just two or three days before the glucose challenge test, you're more likely to pass it. And I've seen patients who have kind of tried to like, quote unquote, trick the system. But I've also seen patients who purposely try to restrict carbs so that they pass it and then they're more likely to fail it. So don't try to trick the system. But in patients who are low carb, I don't recommend an oral glucose tolerance test. I recommend just to check the blood sugars because at the end of the day, what I wanna know as a clinician is do you have normal fasting blood sugars less than 95? And do you have two hour postprandial? So two hours after your meals are your blood sugars less than 120? And if the answer to that is yes, then, then you obviously don't have gestational diabetes for whatever diet you're eating. So for me, I am more of a fan of just letting the patients check their blood sugars for about a week, um, eating how they normally would eat. And if they pass that, they can stop testing. Um, I do think continuous glucose monitoring is great because it's just less arduous to the patients. They don't have to poke their finger four times a day um, because that's how often we make them check. And I think it also allows them to just see what's happening with their blood sugars over a 24 hour period. Because certainly we do have this small subset of patients that really get a robust Dawn effect. And for anybody that doesn't know what that is, it's where they have these elevated fastings in the morning due to a cortisol response about 36 minutes after you wake, even though their postprandial blood sugars look good. 
So I think there's more utility in a patient that's low carb to just do glucose testing, make sure it's normal. With that said, I've had ketogenic patients, not carnivore, but I've had ketogenic patients that have still developed gestational diabetes. And they literally, by the end of it, are basically only eating like steak. And that's just because it's a spectrum. So the level of insulin resistance is a spectrum. Um, and I've even had, you know, skinny patients, like this isn't just your obese insulin resistant PCOS patient that gets pregnant. I mean, I've had patients develop pretty severe insulin resistance. And we know that it's really a linear effect The the more hyperglycemia and hyperinsulinemia, which is a big one too, um, because there's patients that pass the test, but still are passing it at the cost of a huge level of insulin. Um, and those patients are still more likely to have babies who go on to develop obesity and diabetes if they don't control carb intake. And those women are more likely to have preeclampsia as well, which a lot of people don't associate hypertensive disease of pregnancy with carb intake in pregnancy, and they are directly related. Yeah, I think that's, and that's a good point. And I know you're not a pediatrician, but obviously you deal with a lot of babies, at least for a few minutes. Um, we see a lot of these kids where, you know, their, their, their mothers are diabetic, pre-diabetic, hyperinsulinemic, and they see, they, they sort of, they're in this fetal, fetal milieu of hyperinsulinemia. And, and so uh, that does seem to have an effect and, and it can have a life, maybe perhaps, perhaps a lifelong effect. And this is where we think this is a genetic disease, where I think it's just a maternal you know, fetal environment type of issue that's going on. Now, I want to come back to, you know, because I know you and Danny have had differential responses to the glucose, you know, the glucose or the honey challenges or whatever on your on your CGMs. And the question is, you know, is there a genetic difference? I mean, my, my assumption is your background is Northern, Northern European, just, just yep. maybe I'm wrong, but you certainly look that way. And Danny probably maybe, you know, in a more warmer climate would be my guess. I don't know. But I just wonder, because there's some thought that insulin resistance was actually a genetic selection back, you know, there's an evolutionary theory of why people are insulin resistant, and it may have been to do to cold weather climate to not having access to carbohydrates ancestrally. And so it may be that, you know, you just have this genetic makeup that, that makes carbs less friendly towards you or somebody that didn't have that, you know, uh, sort of evolutionary or genetic lineage may have a little better response to that. I think that's, you know, that, that's just you know, theoretical, but there's definitely some studies on that. Let me ask you, and I don't know how much you get into this, you know, probably being as, as an OB-GYN doing a lot of baby delivering, how much your gynecology practice, are you dealing with a lot of menopausal women? And, and if so, why do these women that go through menopause, why do they gain weight? What's going on metabolically and what's going on hormonally? And, and how do they fix it or can they fix it? Because this yeah, is just yeah. I get all the time. And I'm just like, you know, it, it, it seems very to just what is actually going on physiologically that makes them often gain weight? Yeah, I just had a great conversation recently with Kelly Hogan about this whole thing. So basically, when women go through their years of fertility in a, in a menstruating woman, you go through two weeks of estrogen, two weeks of progesterone, right? And then as you get to about five to 10 years out from menopause, you go through this period called perimenopause. And what's happening is that every single month, your brain is trying to stimulate your ovary to ovulate. And you're only born with a certain amount of eggs in your entire lifetime. And as you get closer to menopause, that pool of eggs decreases and there's just not as many follicles in the ovary to respond to the signal from the brain. And so if we drew a graph of what estrogen secretion looks like in perimenopause, it's psychotic. It's like one month it's 250, the next month it's 20, the next month it's 150, then it's 40. I mean, it's just all over the place. So you get this huge fluctuation in estrogen that happens and you're starting to see a decline in progesterone production. And progesterone is kind of the balance to estrogen in a sense. So we start to see women that don't have enough progesterone, they have psychotic levels of estrogen happening, and each woman will experience different symptoms as they go through this transition. They might start to have regular bleeding, they start to notice brain fog, a reduction in um, sex drive, they might start to have hot flashes and night sweats, especially as that estrogen gets very low. And then eventually they'll go through menopause. And the clinical definition of menopause is when you haven't had a period for 12 months. And, and that's basically menopause. Now, from a dietary perspective, as women lose their estrogen, as the estrogen basically goes close to zero, women become physiologically more insulin resistant. So we know the studies show that as the estrogen goes to zero and the woman becomes menopausal, 
They see an increase in visceral fat deposition around the organs. Um, they start to lose, um, they start to become more osteopenic and osteoporotic because their bone health diminishes and their, and their risk of cardiovascular disease goes up. They basically start to equal men once they lose their estrogen. And um, I have talked on, on other podcasts too about hormone replacement therapy. And it's funny because in the low carb carnivore world, people are very um, resistant to medical treatment, right? They just feel like the doctors are just pill pushers and, you know, they, but hormone replacement therapy, I want everybody to think of it more as like biohacking. Um, and although I'm not talking about men, I'm not talking about testosterone replacement therapy, although that's a whole issue too, andropause and early andropause. But hormone replacement for women, um, estrogen replacement has a lot of benefits because of this physiologic insulin resistance. But I think people that eat carnivore and low carb transition through this phase a lot better um, because they're, they're not eating all the carbs. And so the, the sudden insulin resistance isn't as big of an issue for them. I think they tend to have less symptoms. Um, our sex hormones are literally made from cholesterol. So they're getting lots of these bioavailable nutrients that are helping their systems um, work work more efficiently. Um, but hormone replacement therapy definitely has its place for a lot of patients, but diet is huge. And so for my menopausal patients, when they come in and they're like, all of a sudden overnight, I gained 15 pounds. I feel horrible. The first thing I do is we talk about their nutrition because that's the number one thing that can impact how they feel, but they have to kind of maximize nutrition and exercise and sleep and stress reduction first before I ever give anybody hormones, because those things matter. You can't just throw estrogen in a menopausal woman and it's going to reverse all these changes. Like I can't make you 40 again. Um, and so it's super important to think about diet when we make this transition, but it's a, it's a normal change in a woman's life. Um, as you get closer to menopause and, and through menopause, this, this reduction in estrogen, and it does have physiologic consequences. Yeah. Let me, let me ask you about, cause you mentioned with yourself that you, you were hypothyroid we see a, a pretty robust relationship between hypothyroidism and, and diabetes, prediabetes. Uh, and women in particular seem to have a higher incidence of hypothyroidism. I mean, it seems like there's more women on thyroid replacement than men. At least that's been my experience. I don't know if you deal with that a lot in your patients. And if so, can you discuss that a little bit? Yeah. So thyroid disease is more common in women than men. Um, and there's really two large causes of, of hypothyroidism in the US, iodine deficiency and then autoimmune conditions. So I've had my antibodies tested. My hypothyroidism was not due to antibody production. So people have heard of Hashimoto's. That's when you make an antibody against one of your enzymes that works in your thyroid. Thyroid peroxidase is the, is the most common one that we see, the TPO antibody. But then the second one is iodine deficiency. I think the one that we really don't talk about is insulin resistance. And I think that's probably why I had hypothyroidism is because I was very insulin resistant. And what happens in a lot of these women that are very insulin resistant, let's just think about like a PCOS patient, for instance, because I was told I had PCOS. And so they get very, what we call estrogen dominant. And as you start to have these hormonal changes that happen, there's, there's another cascade that happens as you start increasing things like sex hormone binding globulin and thyroid binding globulin. And a lot of times what happens is you start binding up your thyroid hormones. So it doesn't work um, as efficiently. Also, when we think about hormonal influence and dietary influence, if you're having to metabolize a lot of excess estrogen, you're more likely to have micronutrient depletions. And those are super important for thyroid health too. So zinc, selenium, magnesium are super helpful or super important for thyroid function. And then also the other thing that women um, are exposed to in their lifetime is birth control. And um, birth control pills, and particularly oral contraceptives, deplete the body of these B vitamins, zinc, selenium, magnesium. They also deplete your vitamin C and E and cause oxidative stress, and they drag on the thyroid significantly. And this is something that OBGYNs, I don't honestly think, know about or understand. Um, the implications of some of these things. And so once again, if this patient doesn't have an optimal diet, um, they're more likely to develop hypothyroidism um, on these types of medications. But insulin resistance is a huge driver of, of thyroid health. And, um, and especially as women go through, um, go through perimenopause and menopause, we start to see a lot of, of thyroid dysfunction as well. Yeah, let me just touch on a couple other common topics. One is PCOS. Um, how do we treat it? Does diet have a role in there? And the other thing is fertility. It seems like infertility rates have gone up. 
uh, despite the fact that we are better nourished. I mean, I wouldn't say better nourished. We're, we've got more calories for sure. And, and one of the thoughts is, you know, you, you're fertile when you're fat or when you have adequate fat stores. And we see the opposite when women that are become amenorrheic when they, you know, run themselves to the ground. You see the female athlete triad, but we don't have that in most women that are infertile. So what's going on with infertility and PCOS and how do we generally fix it? Yeah, so infertility is definitely on the rise and it's not just female factor infertility. I'm starting to see a sharp increase in male factor infertility because I think the nutritional um, influence in men's diets and sperm health is completely um, completely under um, represented in the fertility world. Um, and kind of like I had mentioned previously, I'm not a, I don't treat men, but everybody has probably seen in their town that these testosterone clinics are popping up because men are developing micronutrient deficiencies, insulin resistance, it's hurting their testosterone production and testosterone is super important for sperm production and spermatogenesis. And the problem is I have started to see couples where the, the male partner has sought testosterone therapy and nobody told him that it would basically make his sperm go to zero. So I've had these women where I've done a workup, everything's completely normal. I get a semen analysis on the partner and he has no sperm. And he's like, oh, by the way, I've been doing these testosterone injections. So that's something that's super important for any man that's listening on here is those things um, do have a role in your fertility. In women, um, when we look at infertility, um, one of the most common causes of infertility is what we call anovulation, where the woman is not actually releasing an egg to be fertilized. And the most common reason for that is, is PCOS or insulin resistance at the level of the ovary. And so what's happening is this hyperinsulinemic state, this high insulin state is driving androgen production um, from the ovaries. And so they're producing tons of testosterone and, and things like that, which further exacerbate the insulin resistance. Um, and in these situations, diet for me is the number one therapy. Now, if you go do a literature search right now on polycystic ovarian syndrome, you're going to see all sorts of studies on um, different medications to not only, you know, to treat their hirsutism. So they get lots of acne, they get dark hair growth. So you're going to see lots of studies done on that. You're going to see um, studies done on just putting them on birth control pills and things like that to help um, them restore their periods and to decrease the risk of cardiovascular disease long-term. And none of these things are fixing the underlying problem. Now, I will tell you with PCOS that it's a spectrum of disease and there certainly is some genetic susceptibility, um, especially in our patients that are like what we call skinny PCOS. So they have very normal body mass index, um, but and sometimes in these situations I've tested and they actually have pretty good peripheral insulin resistance. Um, so there's a, a lot that we don't know from the pathophysiologic standpoint, especially in these patients, but the vast majority of my PCOS patients come in, they're overweight, they're obese, um, they have horrible diets. And just by restoring their nutrition with a low carb diet, a lot of times we can get them to spontaneously start ovulating again. And when you look at the studies that's been shown time and time again, that you put them on any sort of caloric restrictive diet and they lose 10% of their body weight, they'll start ovulating again. Um, but a lot of times I see them just go back to their old ways and, and they have the same problems again. And so for me, it's, and especially if they really are trying to get pregnant, um, you want a woman to have optimal nutrition prior to conception. Like when you start your pregnancy, that's not the time to like all of a sudden, you know, start trying to fix things. Um, when we look at pregnancies, the nutritional deficit that a pregnancy puts on a woman, it takes almost three years to replete her micronutrients, which means that before your first pregnancy, you want your nutrition to be in a good place for a considerable amount of time. And things like prenatal vitamins and supplements, they're great, but they're like an insurance policy. Those nutrients are not as bioavailable as the ones from food. Um, and so in a patient where I'm you know, trying to help them with fertility, diet is absolutely number one. And when you think about the macro and micronutrients that you need to build a really strong human baby, um, you need adequate protein because I think of amino acids like the Lego blocks and you want to have enough of those to build your baby. You need lots of fat because fat is super important, not only for your sex hormones like estrogen and progesterone, but the neurologic development of your baby is dependent upon cholesterol. Our cells are literally made from cholesterol. And when you look at carbs, um, they really don't add a lot to the picture. And although we tell patients, you know, 175 grams of carbs is the, the lower threshold in pregnancy, I find that just to not be true. Um, I have patients that eat a lot less than that. 
Um, and, and most of the carbs that women eat are, are just fortified anyway. Um, they don't really have bioavailable nutrients in them. So back to the PCOS thing, diet is 100% number one. I have tons of patients, with tons of success. And you guys know that on MeetRx. I'm sure you've seen tons of women who have changed their diet and had wild success with fixing their PCOS and getting their periods back to a regular place. And um, I, I wish more physicians talked about it. Yeah, that's some great information. So I, I would say um, we do have a lot of women, and there's a lot of women that have gone on pregnancies and done it strictly carnivore with, you know, without really carbohydrates. You know, sometimes they say they're in the first trimester, they, 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 they have a hard time with that. I don't know if it's with the hyperemesis or the, you know, the uh, HCG levels spiking up or something. I don't, I don't know if that changes their dietary approach. But um, it, so two questions. I mean, if, if a woman were wanting to say, hey, I want to stay on a carnivore diet and go through pregnancy, what would you tell them to be concerned about? How would you maybe supplement that? And then the other question is, you know, at the other end of the spectrum, we have women, postmenopausal women worried about sarcopenia, osteoporosis. You know, there's this back and forth between uh, uh, hormones and breast cancer versus not breast cancer. And I don't know that it's, I know some people saying bioidentical seems to avoid that problem. But can you speak to both of those issues? So carnivore pregnancies and then the later osteoporosis versus breast cancer, how do we, how do we, how do we, navigate that situation those are like two ends of the spectrum <laughs> okay so low carb carnivore in pregnancy so for me you know talking to a pregnant woman about her diet is that she's getting adequate micronutrients for her baby so when we look at a carnivore diet it's obviously it's got a lot of protein and it's got a lot of fat which are the, the most important macronutrients in pregnancy even the institute of medicine says in their guidelines that in the face of adequate fat and protein and consumption carbs are essentially or are non-essential for human life and so um, adequate protein adequate fat so carnivore they've got that covered right so then we look at micronutrients so you need um, tons of choline which is great because they're eating meat they're eating eggs so they're getting lots of choline you need lots of b vitamins um, you need extra vitamin d so for me a lot of women you know i encourage them to eat organ meats if they can or to take organ meat supplements um, just because um, liver in particular, like liver, bone marrow, and heart have, have lots of those extra, you know, micronutrients. Um, but I have no issue with women continuing to eat however they ate, you know, prior to pregnancy, if they're healthy. Um, I do find, like you mentioned in the first trimester, that even my most carnivore women have a really rough time. Um, they'll develop like meat aversions, um, they'll develop hyperemesis, and sometimes they can only eat um, carbs and things like that. But the thing you need to know about the first trimester of pregnancy is um, immediately when you get pregnant, the pancreas starts putting out about 30% more insulin. And so, and a lot of people think that these blood sugar dysregulations are, are what really exacerbate this, this feeling of, of hyperemesis and, and food aversions. And then of course your HCG peaks at 10 weeks. So a lot of it's due to the HCG um, hormone as well. But in the first trimester, a lot of times it's just survival. Um, but I'll tell you, if ketosis killed human babies, not a lot of women would make it through the first trimester because, I mean, I have some patients that can just barely eat anything. Um, sometimes it's a texture thing. So sometimes figuring out ways to get liquid forms of nutrition um, can be important. But in the first trimester, you actually have very good insulin sensitivity. So I don't worry you know, quite as much um, about it in the first trimester, although this is also the window of critical organ development in the baby. So pretty much a, a lot of very important things happen um, up until the eighth week um, that a woman's pregnant. And so it is important that we're getting nutrients. And so a lot of times I have to watch their hydration and their weight and things very closely. As we go through pregnancy, like I talked about earlier in this, this talk is that women become physiologic, more insulin resistant. And so my low carb carnivore people just tend to do great because they're not eating the carbs anyway. And so insulin doesn't, doesn't seem to be an issue. And babies inside the womb become... Uh, ketones are normal in a pregnant woman. We have thought for the longest time that they're pathologic and they're not. And one of the biggest things that just pulls my, <laughs> want to pull my hair out sometimes is when nutritionists tell patients like with gestational diabetes to check their urinary ketones. Urinary ketones and serum ketones do not correlate, first of all, at all. Um, and it is normal for a pregnant woman to have ketones in her bloodstream. And then, um, we know also that babies produce their own ketones, especially in the third trimester, because we've done studies where we've looked at the umbilical cord blood and compared them to serum ketone levels in women, and babies actually produce their own ketones, and ketones are protective, essentially, to human life, and they're important for brain development, and breastfed babies are in ketosis quite often, 
um, and it's good for their neurologic development. It's actually what helps myelinate the neurons in the baby's brain. And then it isn't until they turn six months old and we start giving them oats and rice and goldfish crackers and, and all that, that they're essentially kicked out of ketosis forever. So, um, you know, these patients a lot of times are feeding their baby's liver and meat and those things. And when you take a little child like that, um, they'll eat it. It's crazy. I mean, you just, I think a lot of it is your parental perception of what your child wants or doesn't want. And we went through that as we transitioned our family. Um, and so it's completely healthy. And I, you know, you of course can't study this in pregnant women. I cannot do a randomized control trial until these women to eat 200 carbs and these women to eat hundred and these women to be zero carb. It's just not ethical to do that, but certainly um, observational and anecdotal evidence. These patients have all had healthy pregnancies without complications and healthy babies. And so um, I encourage women to eat a diet that's full of micronutrients and protein and fat. Um, so then on to your second question, uh, you were saying sarcopenia and osteoporosis. Remind me again, meat and... Well, I mean, I think it more result. Well, I mean, certainly that aspect of it. You know, what, how do we how do we avoid that? But I mean, also there's a hormonal aspect. Obviously, as you see right. women get postmenopausal, and there's there's been a lot of research about you know supplementation, you know, selective estrogen re re receptor modulators, and uh, um, does that lead to higher risk of breast cancer versus preventing osteoporosis? So, do we have any sort of are we at a landing point where we have a consensus on, on how to, how to man, manage those things? I mean, I think from the, you know, the diet and nutrition standpoint, eat more protein workout would be my answer. But I mean, it's from the hormonal side. How do we, how do we uh, navigate that for women? Yeah. So when we talked about this menopausal transition, when women flip into menopause and the estrogen is extremely low, Part of the reason that they suddenly gain a lot of weight, first of all, is because they become more insulin resistant. But secondly, as we age, we lose about 10% of our lean body mass with each decade of our life. And as you age, you also become less efficient at utilization of amino acids in the diet. So when you look at a woman from her 30s or her 40s to her 50s to her 60s, you actually need more protein as you age. Um, which is going to be very hard if you have a woman that's not used to eating meat. So as we age, we actually need more protein. And when you talk about protecting against um, metabolic disease um, and the things that are most likely to kill you, right, cancer and cardiovascular disease, having a lot of muscle is protective against those things. And so these women actually need to be eating more protein. And like you mentioned, eat meat and lift weights, right? Like that's, <laughs> that's kind of my motto too, eat meat and lift weights because as you age, you also need to be stimulating the muscle. And so not only just eating meat, but your brain actually has to tell your bicep that you still need it. So you need to be putting that neurologic output out there to tell your body to maintain its muscle mass. And so diet is super important here. Now for bone health, um, estrogen and testosterone are super important for bone health. And so as we go through um, menopause and we lose that estrogen and, and the postmenopausal ovary still makes actually a decent amount of testosterone, but we definitely lose our estrogen. We are at risk for osteopenia and osteoporosis. Now, adequate protein in the diet and resistance training, the two things that also help with sarcopenia, also help prevent osteoporosis and osteopenia. And so um, now hormone replacement therapy does help. So if I give a place, if I give a patient estrogen and testosterone replacement therapy postmenopausally, it does have a protective effect on her heart, her brain, and her bones. And so, you know, the question being is even if I'm carnivore and I, you know, transition into menopause, should I consider these therapies? Um, it, you know, it's possible that you, especially if you have like a strong family history of osteoporosis, or if you're a very small woman, um, if you've ever been a smoker in your lifetime, I mean, you look at your other risk factors, but estrogen replacement therapy and testosterone replacement therapy do have benefits for those things. Doesn't mean every single woman should be on them. Not necessarily. And you brought up the, you know, the thing about cancer. A lot of women have a perception in their mind that hormone replacement therapy increases their risk for cancer. And what we know as far as breast cancer risk is more likely what's happening is that cancer by the time it starts as like one cell in the breast and turns into something that I could feel or see on mammography, it takes about 10 years for that to develop. So a lot of times in these situations, a patient probably already has a little cluster of cancer cells. You give them hormone therapy and boom, it makes it grow faster. When we look across the board on hormone replacement therapy, 
about one additional woman per thousand will develop something like breast cancer on hormone replacement therapies, which is why we don't just give it to every single woman and we, we select them you know, individually. But also when you think about the other um, lifestyle behaviors that are protective against something like breast cancer, um, nutrition, being at a normal body weight, um, environmental estrogen exposure, not smoking, exercising, all of these things um, you know, are protective. And so you really have to kind of think of the big picture um, and, and really individualize it to the patient. Yeah, I just got a question in here. Somebody wanted to, to get answered. Uh, PCOS, someone has lost weight down to a, a sort of a healthy BMI, still not ovulating. Is there additional things that are likely still going on that's preventing the, the normal function? Yeah. So there's, there's other reasons why you might not be ovulating. Um, we, of course, think about like premature menopause or premature ovarian failure. So there's other things you want to look at. You want to do an ultrasound and look at their follicle count. You want to check a, a lab called anti-malarian hormone, which is kind of a good marker of, of egg quality um, and reserve, essentially. Um, if those things look normal, you have to be thinking about other um, endocrine problems that patients can have. Um, sometimes PCOS can mimic um, like congenital adrenal hyperplasia. I mean, there's definitely lots of other things you need to look at. But the, the tough thing too about infertility is, is sometimes we do a lot of testing and everything really looks normal. I mean, there's certainly some things we don't know about infertility. Um, but in PCOS patients, I mean, it really truly looks like PCOS, which PCOS, you, you technically need to have anovulation, and then you need to have clinical or serum signs of hyperandrogenism. So if you tr truly believe that it's PCOS in these situations, um, we do know that sometimes to ovulate, these patients need medications um, that stimulate their FSH and LH. Um, and so I've had patients, you know, that even optimize their diet and still need medications. Um, but the body weight just by itself sometimes doesn't fix the problem because we know we have these skinny PCOS patients that already start at a normal BMI and are anovulatory. In these situations, we don't want them losing more weight because they still need some body fat for estrogen production. Um, but, um, but sometimes it, it takes other manipulations of the diet and sometimes it does take medications if they really truly want to get pregnant. Yeah, and I wonder if they just kind of starve themselves down to the weight and they're just under eating calorically and you're not going to perhaps yeah, ovulate point. in that situation too, right? Yeah, that's a good point too. When patients are aggressively dieting, um, the, you know, the body is always through these nutrient sensing pathways kind of taking a survey. Is this a great time to reproduce? Is this a great time to have a baby? And if you've been in a caloric deficit for a long time, and I've seen this sometimes in carnivore women who become amenorrheic, um, is that they're, they're truly under eating. And um, even though they're, you know, eating good foods, um, if you under eat for a long period of time, your body may say this is not a good time to reproduce. And so sometimes even staying low carb or carnivore, but increasing calories can sometimes help a woman to start ovulating again. Yeah, you brought up a great point. You alluded to environmental estrogens. Um, can you d discuss a little more in our phytoestrogens? Because there's some controversy if they actually have an impact. So phytoestrogens, as you know, are plant estrogens, but don't quite have the same structure as, as what we have with what we make. But thoughts on phytoestrogens? And then what, what do you mean by the other environmental estrogens so for people that aren't aware of those? Yeah, okay, so phytoestrogens um, essentially act as estrogens in our body. Soy is the biggest one because everything is going plant-based now. So there's like soy protein and, and, and of course soybean oil and things like this. So phytoestrogens estrogens in the diet, everything that we put inside our body, and this actually goes for environmental estrogens too, but everything that we not only put in our body so we eat, but things that get absorbed through our skin. So our skin is our largest organ and it's very... Um, very good at absorbing anything that we put on it, like perfumes, lotions, soaps, detergents. A lot of these things can act as, as estrogen mimickers in the body. And in our body, estrogen is an amazing hormone, but it's what I call use it and use it and lose it. <laughs> so it, it should go do what it's supposed to do, and then you have to get rid of it. And our liver is what metabolizes, I hate the word detoxify, but essentially detoxifies our estrogen through three different phases. So phase one and phase two are in the liver, and phase three is in our gut. And we essentially poop out or pee out a lot of our estrogen metabolites. The problem with all these in phytoestrogens um, or, or environmental estrogens, and these are things like plastics, so like plastic water bottles, plastic food storage containers, um, thermal receipt paper is a huge one that people don't know about. Just touching that thermal receipt paper, you're absorbing a lot of um, endocrine disruptors like BPA. Um, but the problem is, is that our liver, if you're not doing a good job of metabolizing 
detoxifying your own estrogen and then you throw a bunch of these other things in the bathtub, it's hard to get all of it to drain out. And that's when it starts to cause disruptions in our bodies. So for some people, they might be able to eat soy. I mean, if they're good at, you know, detoxifying their own estrogen, you know, they may do fine with phytoestrogens in their diet. But if there's somebody that has estrogen dominance and trouble metabolizing their own estrogen, and you throw a bunch of phytoestrogens in there, it could really make the problem worse. Um, and really across the board, the environmental estrogens and the chemicals and the phthalates and plastics and things that we use in our world, the more that you can reduce those in your daily life, um, the better you're going to be. So switching to like stainless steel and glass food storage containers for women, really looking at the products and cosmetics and things that you're putting, you know, on and inside your body um, are, are truly important. Okay. Let me just, one, one, one last question, Jamie. Um, differences in women with, with compared to men with regard to dietary strategies, fasting, fat content, is there, is there, are there different differential considerations? Do you think do they have to approach diet a little differently than men do? Yeah. So um, women are definitely different than men because our bodies are, like I said, through these nutrient sensing pathways, always trying to decide if this is a good time to reproduce. Um, women have to be careful with fasting, I think. Um, I have women that can fast and do just fine, but I've had a lot of women that get very aggressive, um, really more with extended fasting and they might lose their period. Fasting is a stress on the body. So just like you and I, Dr. Baker, we go out and we do like, you know, exercise stress is this, this fasting is a stress on the body so that the body stimulates its own internal processes, um, you know, to go through autophagy and to repair and regenerate cells and things like that. And so fasting is a tool you need to eat. Like we talked about, like if you are in a severe calorie deficit for a long time, your body is going to start shutting down processes to try to conserve that energy. So fasting is a tool. Now we also know that there's some genetic susceptibility, like some people feel great fasting and some people don't. So it's very patient specific, but for women in particular, you have to be careful with fasting, especially extended fasting. I don't find most women do fine with intermittent fasting, like a 16, eight, but I have some women that cannot do OMAD. Um, I, you know, I find some women that are just eating one meal a day. And I think some of it is that they're not eating enough in that one meal. So like for me, you know, I, I want women to like eat a lot of protein in their diet. And I personally try to eat at one gram per pound of my body weight. Now for me to eat that in one meal is very difficult. Um, I, I can't, I mean, I could eat 160 grams of protein, but when you look at the max efficiency of digestion of protein, 40 to 50 grams in a meal is probably adequate. And so if a woman's chronically doing OMAD for long periods of time, I mean, she really might be under consuming, um, you know, protein. So I think women really just need to think about what, what is your goal? Like think of everything in context of like what your goal is, you know, is it a certain weight? Is it to build muscle? Is it metabolic health? Is it to cure your X, Y, Z condition? And then find something that works for you, but don't, don't oversteer. That's what I call it. Like don't oversteer. Like more is not necessarily better. Um, and so I think women do need to really be cautious with fasting. Yeah. I, and again, I, I, I'm glad you put the caveat in there about, you know, maybe you can go 12, 16 hours, not a problem. But when you start getting into these, we want to do 24, 48, 72 hour fasts. It, sometimes it's a struggle. I mean, not, not, not all women, but many. So I think there, there is some caution there and probably getting enough. And, and I like the fact that, you know, protein, you know, particularly if your goal is to put on muscle. I mean, it's hard to put on muscle without protein, you know, at least a certain amount. And I think women should just as much as men be coveting strength and, and, uh, and muscle. And I think hopefully it's, it's good to see people like you that are, sort of getting out there as a physician say, hey, women need muscle. I mean, it's so important. We had Dr. Gabrielle Lyon. I'm sure you're familiar with her, and she's the same thing. She's very muscle-centric. Uh, Jamie, you, this has been an hour. This has been wonderful. Thank you so much for, for your time, uh, and thank you for what you do for everybody else. Tell me what, what's, what's coming up for you. I mean, I know we got the uh, Mrs. America contest, which I'm sure you're going to kick butt on, but what else you got in the hopper for the rest of the year and maybe early in the next year? And then where can people go to find out more about you? Yeah, so I'm focusing right now on Mrs. America because, like I said, it would be amazing to have a physician meat eater in that level of position. And I think we could have a lot of influence. Not only, I have a lot of international followers too, so I think that would just be an amazing opportunity. So that's kind of my focus right now. Um, I'm working on some projects. I'm, I'm working on a book. <laughs> um, and so people can find me. I'm 
very more active on Instagram, Dr. Fit and Fabulous. I do have a Facebook page. I do have a coaching group too um, that runs in kind of eight week sessions. Speaking engagements, I don't know. I don't know about 2021. I don't have a crystal ball, but um, we will uh, we will see what it brings. I mean, I'd, I'd love to get out there and uh, and see people again, but 2020 has been a gem. <laughs> All right. And, and just for you guys, Dr. Fit and, Fit and Fab, you have to spell out the whole word doctor because I, I always made that mistake when I'm trying to find you on Instagram. I type in DR Fit and Fab and I couldn't find you. So type out Dr. D-O-C-T-O-R and then Fit and Fabulous. Jamie, once again, it's a pleasure talking to you. Good luck to you. Keep up the good work. Uh, thank you, everybody, for attending. I'll see many of you guys back tomorrow. Take care now. All right. Thanks, Jamie. Bye-bye. Thanks, Tom.